Life can be a real adventure. Hot, fast, slow or sad. Maybe sometimes even filled with ups and downs. But according to psychiatrists, any part of life can be labeled a mental illness. Really? Like what? Let's say you're upset after a bad breakup. Well, that could be labeled depression. What if you're nervous before speaking in public? Anxiety disorder. Or being really talkative and super active? Manic. That sounds a little crazy. It does. But how much does this really happen? Let's go ask. How many people do you know that have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Diagnosed with a mental um, God, off the top of my head, maybe one person that I know who's been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Probably just one. So, yeah. Maybe two or three people, maybe in the three or four range. Four? Four or five? Maybe five. Six people in the household. Six, seven? Ten. A dozen or so. About 20. How about 30? Would definitely be in the hundreds for sure. The total number of people that I know in my, in my lifetime has been diagnosed with a mental disorder probably fall around the range of of 100 to 150, and I'm 23 years old. Wow, but where are these disorders all coming from? From Psychiatry's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's 943 pages long and covers everything from depression and anxiety to stuttering, cigarette addiction, fear of spiders, nightmares, problems with math, and even disorder of infancy all reinterpreted and many falsely labeled as a brain disease. But people do have serious problems in life. Absolutely, but psychiatrists reduce them down to something wrong with your brain. So let me get this straight. Psychiatrists have a book of life problems reinterpreted as mental disorders? That's right. Wow, then it must be backed up by a lot of science. You'd think so, but it isn't. Psychiatrists at one of their recent conventions admitted to it. Listen to this. The DSM is made up by committees of men who have political opinion and women too who have biases and, and political opinions uh, and so there isn't nearly as much science in DSM as there ought to be. Like in the previous one people had a meeting in the bathroom and they decided that something should be in there and then they went, would go and propose it to the whole committee. You have this kind of uh, lumping together of several, uh, uh, of several observations and when you get enough of them in one tent you got a diagnosis. DSM system is not uh, the real system or the diagnosis. A lot of the disorders that are in there haven't necessarily been rigorously validated. It's just the best tool that we have available, but it is not perfect. It's so useless that if you give me a patient and the DSM, I'll make at least 20 diagnoses on the same patient. You have to take it with a grain of salt anyway. It's actually getting more and more complicated. We're left with diagnosing things on the basis of checklists and questionnaires, which leaves us sort of out of, as you said, uh, the rest of medicine um, because we don't have a biological uh, test. Amazing. The lack of science in the DSM is actually an open secret. Here's what some professionals have to say about it. The DSM is a sham. It's been um, described as a house of cards. Why? Because the diagnoses are theoretical. They're not based on scientific measurements. It's sort of a shaky level built on another shaky level built on another shaky level. It is flimsy and that it is um, easily collapsible under the scrutiny of critical thinking. If you just pull one little fragment of the reasoning aside and question it thoroughly, you'll find it doesn't stand up and then that means that the whole organism collapses because you've got some wrong premises in there somewhere. In fact, they're all over the place. It is indeed a house of cards because it's predicated on not a solid structure. It is built to create an apparently legitimate edifice, which results in a diagnosis. But any serious inquiry will show it to be illegitimate. So when school authorities tell a mother, as you already heard, that her son is sick and needs to be on drugs, how in the world is she to know that that is simply a lie? How is she to recognize that what experts now call attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is simply not a disease? Now, such a mother is not an expert in the history of psychiatry. She does not know that psychiatrists have for hundreds of years used diagnostic terms, so-called diagnostic terms, to stigmatize and control people. I will only give you a few dramatic examples. When black slaves in the South ran away to freedom, 
It wasn't that they wanted to be free. They suffered from a disease called drapetomania. From drapetes, runaway slave and mania. I'm not making this up. This was a legitimate diagnosis, just like attention deficit disorder is. <laughs> Women, half the population of mankind, of course, if they were foolish enough to rebel against domination by men, well, then they had a serious disease called hysteria, which was due to their wandering womb. Now, none of those behaviors was ever a disease, and of course, it's not a disease. But nor is attention deficit disorder a disease. No behavior or misbehavior is a disease or can be a disease. That's not what diseases are. So it doesn't matter how a child behaves. There is nothing to examine. If he's sick, then there must be some objective science to it, which can be diagnosed by physicians and objective tests. It's very as soon as you go to a doctor, they take a lot of blood and take x-rays. They don't want to hear how you behave. <laughs> when I went to medical school 60 years ago, there were only a handful of mental diseases. I think there were no more than six or seven. Now there are more than 300. And new ones are, quotes discovered every day. Labeling a child as mentally ill is stigmatization, not diagnosis. Giving a child a psychiatric drug is poisoning, not treatment. Diseases are malfunctions of the human body, of the heart, the liver, the kidney, the brain, and so forth. Typhoid fever is a disease. You all know that. You don't question that. Spring fever All you have to know is English. <laughs> Spring fever is not a disease. Now, why not? Because we all know that it's a figure of speech, a metaphor, a little piece of poetry. Now, so are all mental diseases. Mental disease is a metaphor. The task we set ourselves to combat psychiatric coercion is important. I think it's important. You all think it's important. Not enough people think it's important. It's a noble task, a task in the pursuit of which we must, regardless of obstacles, persevere. Our conscience commands that we do no less. Sent to a psychiatrist um, who saw me again for maybe about 15 minutes, talked to me how I was doing at seven years old, and I left with a prescription for Ritalin. Probably within the first 15 minutes, he diagnosed me with having an anxiety disorder and um, put me on the prescription medication. The amount of time it took for the diagnosis was, I'd say, probably within 10 minutes is, you know, I was diagnosed with anxiety, with depression, within 10 minutes of speaking to the psychiatrist and I was put on those drugs immediately. I received numerous different diagnoses uh, from different doctors and each one gave me a different drug. I didn't have to undergo any tests. I didn't even have to sit there and I didn't have to ask any questions. It was just, that's, that's what you've got. And this is the drug. They really didn't talk to me. They were always talking and questioning my mother. It was all about getting the information from her and not from me. It doesn't make sense to me. I, I researched it, I done my research and I still can't fully understand how you can diagnose somebody with a, a short attention span. There was never an explanation. Nobody really knew what it was or why it was caused or how did you get it? Why did anybody have it? And what could anybody do about it? You know, just here, have some medicine and go away. And I was put on, I mean, a horse's dose of an antidepressant called Effexor, 450 milligrams a day. I mean, they say if you're on 300, you're comatose. It wasn't always Ritalin. It was, went from Ritalin to like Wellbutrin to Concerta to Adderall. I remember asking these doctors, is there any other way we can do this? Is there any other therapy? Is there something we can do that won't make me feel so badly? That won't give me all these side effects and, and just horrible sensations through my body 24 hours a day? Is there something else I can do that might be not having to do with medications? Doctor said, no. See, what you have is very complex. 
you have a chemical imbalance in your brain that the only thing that can correct it is medication. Wow. Lots of diagnoses, but all you seem to get is meds. You know, the disorder in the classification does not require that there be knowledge about its etiology. So in other words, to make a diagnosis, you really don't need to bother with uh, cause and effect. You don't need to know what causes the condition. Wait a minute. If the DSM doesn't tell you what causes its mental disorders, how does psychiatrists discover them in the first place? The answer may surprise you. New diseases are being invented all the time, and I want to emphasize the word invented, because when it comes to psychiatry, mental illnesses are not discovered, they're invented. The way the system works in terms of diagnosis is that every few years, a group of psychiatrists and psychologists sit around in a room and vote on new diagnoses. This is science? I can't believe it. Don't worry, you're not alone. The diseases are voted on? What do you mean? Did you say are they voted into existence? Or voted? As in created. Oh, man. I think that's kind of ridiculous. It's crazy that you would vote. Well, I definitely don't agree. I don't agree with it at all. Mental disorders should be based on scientific research. I have been led to believe that it's all based on medicine and science. So I'm kind of shocked to find that out. <laughs> Me too. There's more. Not only are mental disorders voted into the DSM, but now and then they are also voted out. Take, for example, homosexuality, listed in DSMs 1 and 2 as a mental illness. This is how the editor-in-chief of the DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, explained it. I came up with a definition in 1973 that made it possible to argue that homosexuality was not a mental disorder. On a vote, essentially, at a conference of the American Psychiatric Association, it was removed. Now, did they discover that homosexuality was not a disease through scientific processes? No. It was included for political reasons, and it was removed for political reasons. And the end result is a, is a vote. It's a, it's a supposed democracy. So uh, to call it science is, uh, is a complete fabrication. So the DSM is actually political, not scientific. Right. <laughs> I thought psychiatrists wanted to be seen as doctors. You're right. That's why they had to make their manual look much more scientific. Which it wasn't. So what did they do then? Well, they decided the DSM's next edition was going to be completely different. It was a decision that would change psychiatry forever. If you roll the clock forward to the 1970s in the United States, basically at that time, psychiatry was in very poor shape for a number of reasons. First of all, it was held in very low regard by other members of the medical profession. So psychiatry was the sort of thing you did if you couldn't succeed in any other area of medicine. And people such as Robert Spitzer in America made it very clear that the time had come essentially for psychiatrists, being doctors of medicine, to practice medicine. So if a psychiatrist was spending a lot of time dealing with people who were anxious, depressed, these dilemmas, these problems in living, now essentially had to be redefined. And they were redefined as medical conditions. And their solution to this was to come up with a manual which defined psychiatric disorders more carefully. So hence we have DSM-3, which is the third edition, which is published in 1980. Under Spitzer, Psychiatrists editing the DSM-3 threw out Freudian psychology and decreed that from now on, psychiatry's diagnoses were purely biological. So they finally became scientific? No, actually, not at all. In fact, the political bickering over what disorders to put in and what to leave out of the DSM-3 was even more ridiculous. Here's what one psychiatrist had to say about it. They would squeeze into a room which was about half the size of this one, it was much too small, and Bob would raise a provocative question and people would shout out their opinions from all sides of the room. And whoever shouted loudest tended to be heard. My own impression is it was more like a tobacco auction than a sort of conference. 
And this is what another member of the DSM decision-making panel said. The low level of intellectual effort was shocking. Diagnoses were developed by majority vote on the level we would use to choose a restaurant. You feel like Italian, I feel like Chinese, so let's go to a cafeteria. Then it's typed into the computer. It may reflect on our naivete, but it was our belief that there would be an attempt to look at things scientifically. Sounds like they had a diagnostic manual that looked more scientific, but had no more science in it than before. Meanwhile, the number of mental disorders in the DSM-3 had ballooned to 259. But to sell the idea that psychiatry was a true medical science, they had to spin it with a really impressive scientific-sounding theory. But with DSM-3 from 1980 on, there was the progressive medicalization of psychiatry. And the notion of chemical imbalance was invented and essentially took hold. Whoa, chemical what? Chemical imbalance theory. It was first suggested in 1965 to try to explain how depression might be caused by an imbalance of certain brain chemicals. I'd like to hear this. Joseph Schildkraut theorized that because psychiatric drugs alter the levels of some of these chemicals, then mental illness must be caused by too much or too little of them. Isn't that backwards? It sure is. It's a little like saying that because aspirin stops a headache, that headaches are caused by the deficiency of aspirin. I see what you mean. But it was just convincing enough to give psychiatry and the DSM-3 the superficial aura of science. As Robert Spitzer put it, Psychiatry felt uh, now, gee, we're more scientific, we're part of medicine. So it worked. Yes, and ever since then, psychiatrists and the pharmaceutical industry have relentlessly promoted this chemical imbalance theory both to the medical field and the public. If you are one of the millions of people who live with uncontrollable worry, anxiety, and several of these symptoms for six months or more, you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder, and a chemical imbalance could be to blame. Pristique is thought to work by affecting the levels of two chemicals in the brain. It works to correct chemical imbalances in the brain, which may be related to symptoms of social anxiety disorder. Cymbalta works on serotonin and norepinephrine. Hundreds of thousands of patients have been prescribed Abilify. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Call your doctor. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Pristique is a key in helping to treat my depression. Ask your doctor about Pristique. You come to my office, and I say to you, well, you, you describe what's going on in your life and, and your symptoms, and I say, well, it's clear to me that you've got a chemical imbalance, and we're going to write you a prescription for this. The truth of the matter is there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. There's no test out there that they can depend on that tells you you have a chemical imbalance. There's actually, in fact, dozens of studies showing that there isn't any measurable imbalance. So psychiatrists will explain to patients all the time, this is just like diabetes. In diabetes, you have low insulin, we have to readjust the insulin level. In depression, you have low serotonin, we have to readjust the serotonin level. But actually, we have already proven that there's nothing wrong with serotonin levels. It's completely a myth, disproven by our own evidence. Okay, if we apply these labels, what next? And the what next tends to be, you get a prescription. And the prescription is for a drug that doesn't work very well and is toxic. It's like a one-two punch. The, the, the number one of the one-two punch is the diagnostic manual. You've got all these disorders to choose from. The, the two is the treatment. So you've got the diagnostic manual in place, you've got a machinery in place, and then you've got this treatment that um, is there for the taking. For everything you can think of that might seem to be odd behavior, the psychiatry field has a name for it. And then for every name of every diagnosis you have, there's gonna be pharmacology behind it, and they have a pill for it. Let me fan it out, pick a card, and there you go. Here's your label, and there's the drug that we'll give you to go along with that label. 98%, maybe 99% of people will get a diagnosis that justifies the use of a medication and also a follow-up appointment. Because remember, the, the business of medicine, the business of psychiatry, is seeing patients. And the psychiatrist that tells a patient they don't have a problem and there's no medicine for that problem doesn't have a very busy practice. And that's sort of the purpose of the DSM-345, to provide a diagnosis that can be given a drug for that patient. It's a quick buck. You don't need to do a physical exam. You put it in the chart, it's done. Prescribe away, lifetime patient.